how Ukraine won at like war. In modern war and politics, the information space is one of the most crucial parts of battle. If your ideas get out and win out, that determines everything from whether soldiers and voters join your cause to what they believe about the very truth of the world around them. And if your ideas don't win, you can lose the war before it even begins. In the arena of information war, there was arguably no one more feared over the last decade than Vladimir Putin. Russia's information warriors ran wild for years, hacking democracies by intervening into over 30 national elections from Hungary and Poland to Brexit to the 2016 US presidential race. They elevated conspiracy theories that ranged from QAnon to coronavirus vaccine lies, as well as provided the justification for Russian military action everywhere from Georgia to Syria. Yet when it came time for one of Putin's most ambitious and important operations of all, the invasion of Ukraine, Russia failed at the information side of the war as much as it failed at its plan for a quick, short seizure of Kiev. And the stakes could not have been higher. While unfortunately, Putin's forces can still turn around their military prospects by going back to the old Russian methods of leveling cities, they have no opportunity on the information war side. Ukraine isn't just winning the battlefield for hearts and minds online, it is already won. And it is a narrative that Russia will never be able to change. This story of how Ukraine has been so successful at turning the tables on the supposed Russian masters of information war is crucial to what happened in the battle so far in Ukraine and what happens next. Yet it is also a lesson for any other nation politician, corporation, or activist at how to win at like war, what we call the hacking of social networks, not through malware, but through clicks, likes, and shares. In the online world, there's no single pathway to victory, and a tactic for sure defeat is to just push out one single message by one single messenger. Instead, you want to flood the zone with multiple messages, driven viral by an ever-growing network of audience members who are transformed from target into supporters and then fellow combatants. At this task, Ukraine has been masterful, driving forward 10 essential persuasion messaging themes. Each of these themes then had scores of underlying narratives and examples pushed out by networks that scaled from the hundreds to the millions. The first was to pre-bunk. In the past, Russia drove the conversation, initiating operations at the time and storyline of its choosing. Russian messaging struck at audiences with no pushback, and its physical operations were often aligned with pre-planned incidents and provocations used to justify Russian military action, as well as to confuse both local and international observers to what exactly was happening. In the 2014 attack on Ukraine, that came before this current war, for example, Russia pushed out made up stories of various atrocities, such as Ukrainian soldiers crucifying a three year old boy. Such lies driven viral were both used to stoke local anger and then justify Russia's intervention to seize Ukrainian territories. This time, Russia's adversaries didn't just try to debunk its claims after the fact, which usually doesn't work, but had a strategy to pre-bunk Russia, a network built that ranged from Ukrainian government agencies and individual leader social media accounts to the same for NATO states, especially the Baltics and the Brits, as well as a multi-agency effort within the Biden administration that brought together lessons of the past, as well as teams from the Pentagon, State Department, and intelligence community. One should note that this is an area that the Trump administration would have flailed at. The issue is not just whether a second term Trump would have even pushed back against Russia, given the curious history of Putin being the one leader whom the combatant Trump has never, ever criticized, but that the Trump national security team was incredibly dysfunctional at both staying on message and coordinating across its constantly feuding agencies. But this learning and this network was bolstered by a broader online coalition of democracy activists and OSINT, short for open source intelligence trackers, who also weighed in to preempt 
and pre-bunk the Russians. This multifaceted network got ahead of the Russian goal of justifying its long planned invasion as an emergency response to fake Ukrainian atrocities. Instead, they meticulously documented that Russia's actual months long buildup was playing out. They did so in both formal ways, such as placing into public view satellite photos of huge Russian military deployments as well as personal ways, such as up close snapshots of literal train loads of Russian military vehicles and tr Russian tanks massing near the border. Both were, eye both were eye grabbing in their own manner, showing the scale and the detail of the Russian plans. Another key part was directly debunking the various Russian plan provocation in the last days and hours leading up to the invasion. For example, online sleuths detected Russian leaders' wristwatches showed that Putin's supposed emergency meetings were actually pre-taped. While in turn, the Ukrainian military announced that Russia was about to blow up certain buildings and blame it on them before Russia could actually destroy the buildings. Overall, this pre-bunking set the narrative both of what Russia was planning to invade a smaller sovereign state, as well as took away the Russian attempt to muddy the waters and somehow argue that they were the supposed victim in the story. Once the war began, the strategy then pivoted to a wider series of themes. The second was the early stories of Ukrainians standing up to fight against the odds this was essential to both rally Ukrainians in the early hours of fighting, as well as create the next needed messaging to the West, that Putin's gambit had failed and that Ukrainian Davids were worthy of backing against the Russian Goliath. Probably the most successful was, this, was the so-called Ghost of Kiev, the fighter pilot reported to have shot down multiple Russian jets, becoming the first ace of the war. His historic parallel is actually Edward O'Hare, for whom Chicago's airport is named. The first US ace of World War II was made into a national hero as a morale building effort at the lowest point in the war for America. Now, while the reality of the ghost of Kiev is more likely a mix of truth and exaggeration, Russian jets were definitely shot down, but whether it was six by one pilot is still in dispute, the effect of the story was what mattered more. Virality trumps veracity in online war. Such stories of heroism align with the third idea, card stacking, and pulling out and then driving viral singular examples of its early wins, Ukraine was able to shape the narrative of the overall flow of the online battle. For example, while the overall map showed Russian forces seizing large areas of Ukraine at a pace comparable to the early stages of US invasion of Iraq, the online world instead focused on a series of small unit actions, like the early defeat of a Russian plan to seize, to seize the airport just outside Kiev. As in the pre-bunking, these examples range from the official and the clinical such as video of a successful drone strike pushed out by the Ukrainian Defense Ministry, to the more personalized, such as a Ukrainian soldier walking about in the wake of a firefight with the unmistakable swagger of a victory. Showing the power of narrative, this video of his win had some 2.7 million views, yet the town that he defended has since reportedly been taken by the Russians. People believed that he and Ukraine as a whole was winning, and that's what mattered. The fourth track is martyrdom. In addition to extolling its heroes winning against the odds, Ukraine also made sure to spread tales of those lost in the early fighting. The story of sacrifice added nobility to the cause and also evoked a combination of empathy and anger. In this war, the classic stories of soldiers battling to the end were given online updates. One of the most viral was the outnumbered defenders of Snake Island, 
telling the Russians to go fuck yourself when asked to surrender. As with the ghost of Kiev, the story likely ran ahead of the truth. There are reports that they were ultimately captured rather than killed. But regardless, the phrase has since joined other iconic responses in military history, as well as been placed on everything from Ukrainian highway signs to t-shirts. But just as Taylor Swift, who can be thought of as the Marie von Clausewitz of information warfare once advised in a Wall Street Journal essay, the key to winning, and not just that, but keeping online hearts and minds is to keep your audience fed with a steady cascade of related but new stories. So too has Ukraine pushed out a constant series of online posts about other martyrs, invariably young soldiers who died in some heroic manner, such as sacrificing themselves to blow up a bridge. This links to the fifth narrative, the man of the people. Before the war, Zelensky, the leader of Ukraine, was little known outside the region, while inside Ukraine, Polls found him and his party with just 23% support. Essentially, he was the most popular of a set of deeply unpopular Ukrainian leaders amid distrust of the government in general. These politics may also have tempted Putin to think that just a slight push would be enough to topple the regime. Just one week later, Zelensky is a global icon and polling found that 91% of Ukrainians support his actions. The former performer has done so with acts of personal bravery and the deft use of messaging. A key is how he has played simultaneously to multiple audiences. One is the Ukrainian people and soldiers with whom Zelensky provides the all too rare of an example of a leader who's right there with you, sharing the same risks, literally in the streets and in the trenches. The images of the youthful Zelensky in the field also stands in stark messaging contrast to the elderly Putin in his cold palace, literally distanced from even his own advisors by absurdly long tables. Yet Zelensky's man of the people messaging is also important to Ukraine's essential strategic need to influence the audience of the West and its leaders. When he YouTubed pithy lines like, I need ammunition, not a ride, to the American offers to evacuate him from Kiev at the start of the war, or when he clapped back on Twitter at Italian leaders, he was hitting both emotive and political needs. Again, every act in Like War is about connecting the online show to a real world cause. Zelensky demonstrating that he was personally in the fight was the best way for him to accelerate the aid that Ukraine needed to stay in the fight. Six, civilian harm. The justness of the Ukrainian cause has also been boltered online by a steady flow of messaging about the harm the fighting has caused to regular civilians. The whole Russian invasion in Ukraine is based off its claim to somehow be rescuing these civilians from the supposed atrocities and repression of a neo-Nazi regime, somehow led by a Jew, but set that aside for the moment. This storyline has instead been countered by images and messages of Russian attacks on the people that it was supposedly riding to the aid of. And notable in this are examples of Russian strikes that don't, that don't just resonate visually, but are also clearly and inarguably civilian in nature, such as Russian missiles hitting a playground or a shopping mall. This thread has also link to an ever-growing unfortunate series of clear-cut war crimes, such as shelling ambulances, to the extent that now the International Red Cross is literally subtweeting Russia. Seventh, civilian resistance. Yet the civilian role is not just to play the victim online. Like so many wars, the fight in Ukraine 
and both cause and its information war is about political legitimacy. So it proved hugely important for Ukraine to show not just its soldiers, but its citizens fighting back. And the narrative of popular resistance, stark contrasts prove the most powerful. The iconic one so far has been the elderly Ukrainian woman, hectoring armed Russian soldiers on YouTube, of course, quote, put sunflower seeds in your pocket so they grow when you die, end quote. And like everything else, it became a meme within hours. Yet extending beyond the most famous of these online tales of Ukrainian civilians standing up to Russian soldiers are now literally thousands of the other examples going viral across the web. They extend from blocking Russian tanks to sharing images of Molotov cocktails with bottle labels that say, quote, Putin is a dickhead. Perhaps the most brave, though, are the posts from inside Russian-occupied territories, showing that the supposedly rescued actually now want to be freed. Eight, bandwagoning. All this information messaging is really about motivation. And as any marketer or parent knows, one of the most effective is the urge to join something that is popular, known as bandwagoning. So we've seen the small country under attack instead become a cause that is popular and growing, and importantly, one that you can join too. This is also a bit like shaming those that aren't doing so yet. Others are doing it, why not you? And so we've seen the contributions that you can join in and provide range from enlisting in the fight to providing money or even cryptocurrency. This stratagem also works in the opposite, making your opponent toxic. And no celebrity, let alone nation, has ever been more effective at Ukraine at calling out corporate brands to name and shame them into acting morally. If there is such a thing as cancel culture, the Ukrainians can claim to have honed it in war. Nine, humanizing. There's an irony that in the online world, where so much of what you present to the world is planned and curated, right down to the right lighting for your Instagram or re-recording your YouTube to try and get it right, authenticity is actually the coin of the realm. The more that you can show yourself to be real, the more likely your message is to win out. And recognizing this, the Ukrainians have had a constant theme of humanizing their side, showing off the up close, the personal, reinforces the important sense that these people, thousands of miles away, who we've never met, are actually just like us and thus merit our care and support. This is where actually the pat, this is where arguably the cat is the most powerful of all information warfare weapons. Selfies of civilians showing off their brave cat in a bomb shelter to soldiers in the field with cute cats are among the most viral images of war. It's also an echo of how ISIS members used to pose with their cats to not appear so extreme. So what you see here is a cute cat, but it's also a member of a far right Ukrainian militia unit. This also links with the 10th theme, mockery. War is a serious business, but it has also involved forever a thread of dark humor. And as humor is one of the key emotions that people delight in sharing online, this humor can also be weaponized. Russia's hope for a quick win, both against the West, but also Ukraine, depended on overawing a dispirited foe. Mockery inverts that. By making the attacker the butt of the jokes, they seem small, and the idea of accepting them as the victor becomes absurd. Ukrainians have done this 
in a wire in a wide array of ways. They've displayed and mocked the woefully ill-equipped Russian soldiers. To they've shown off captured POWs. It didn't just reinforce the above narratives of their wins in very human terms, but it also showed off a Russian enemy that isn't actually so fearsome. Now, displaying your prisoners can be viewed as a violation of the Geneva Convention, some believe, but it has a long tradition in war. But Ukraine has taken it to new levels by not just sharing out their trophy tweets and TikToks and Facebook posts and YouTube videos of scared Russian soldiers, literally viewed millions of times, but it's also announced that it was letting them call their mothers back home in Russia. The message somehow brings together everything from empathy to snark. But is it working? By all measures, the combination of these effects have been a stunning success inside Ukraine. This is proven most by the very fact that the Ukrainian state and society didn't collapse the way Putin hoped it would in the first few days of fighting. Indeed, besides the rapid swing in Zelensky's polling, surveys now show that 70% of Ukrainians believe that their military is the side that will ultimately win the war, despite the very real combat power disparities and the territory losses that they've suffered. This disparity makes the other information battlefields so essential for Ukraine. No matter the attitudes and bravery of its people, Ukraine only has a chance if it enlists and keeps the outside world in its fight. And here, the Ukrainian efforts have definitely won. It's yielded the announcement of supplies of lethal military aid from not just NATO, but nations as far away as Australia. In turn, once unthinkable levels of financial sanctions have been put into place to squeeze the Russian economy. Indeed, when even Switzerland agrees to join sanctions against you and Sweden sends you military aid, something neither of them did against even Hitler, you've lost the narrative fight. This shift though has also played out inside American domestic politics, whose divisions was likely another asset that Putin counted on. One of the most notable shifts in American politics and foreign policy discourse over the last decade, decade was the displays of empathy and outright support for Russia and Putin among significant parts of the American body politic. For example, former president and 2024 candidate Donald Trump famously complimented Putin as a quote, genius. While former Secretary of State and also likely 2024 candidate Mike Pompeo literally screamed at a journalist last year, quote, do you think Americans care about fucking Ukraine, end quote. In turn, the host of America's most watched cable news program, Fox's Tucker Carlson, has repeatedly taken Putin's side at any news of Ukraine, most recently weaving it into culture war victimhood, saying, quote, has Putin ever called me a racist? Has he ever threatened to get me fired for disagreeing with him? Vladimir Putin didn't do any of that, end quote, explaining why he supported him. Now, one could get whiplash by how rapidly things changed. The very same people who lionized Putin are now putting Ukrainian flags on their Facebook accounts. Trump moved from complimenting Putin to complimenting Zelensky, who remember, he once withheld $400 million in military aid in a failed attempt to get imaginary dirt on Joe Biden. He described him now as, quote, brave. Pompeo went from saying, why do Americans even care about fucking Ukraine, to tweeting out stories how supporting Ukraine was the key to stopping Putin. And Fox shifted to stories like, quote, Russian Vladimir Putin has the features of a psychopath to quote, 
Ukrainian civilians volunteer to fight for democracy. These decisions likely reflected what they were seeing in the shift in not just the online world, but in the polling numbers. 74% of Americans now take Ukraine's version of the conflict. And notably, Republicans have made the biggest shift of all, a 42% swing in their opinion from being neutral towards Ukraine to now favoring siding with it. Yet the audience that might matter most to whether the Ukraine war ends and how it ends is inside Russia. And here the situation is different than the battles that we have seen Ukraine win so vividly. The Putin regime has spent years building up both direct and indirect ownership control of the media and uses everything from arrests to accidental deaths of activists to reinforce that censorship. And when I say accidental, I mean examples like people, quote, accidentally falling down an empty elevator shaft or accidentally uh, falling out of an open window. Indeed, at the start of this war, the information shaping inside Russia was so effective that many Russians didn't even know they were at war. Another aspect that matters is the different popularity of media platforms. So for example, as much as hashtag support Ukraine has trended on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, the most popular social network for Russians is actually VK. Yet the longer the war goes on, the harder this will be to sustain. Casualties are difficult to keep quiet and undercut a message of an easy win. While the narrative that your side is rescuing civilians is undermined when you get into a dragged out war of the cities. A key factor in this will likely be how all Russian males from the ages of 18 to 27 are conscripted for one year of military service. Yet the Russian military claims that it only sends the contracted portion of its force into war zones. This appears to be another lie that they'll have a hard time keeping and selling to their own population. Indeed, already during a live stream debate in the Russian Federation Council on March 4th, Senator Narasova described of a Russian conscript unit not only being sent to fight in Ukraine, which again is against what their military claims is its policy, but quote, out of a company of a hundred people, only four survived, end quote. The fact that Russia's government has just implemented new laws that threaten 15 years in prison for spreading quote, fake information about the military or the war in Ukraine are actually not signs of power, but signs of weakness and fear that the Putin regime worries that it's losing the fight, again, not just in Ukraine, but in the online battle at home. Another crack appears to be between generations with polling inside Russia showing high levels of support among older Russians for the war. But the last poll showed 47% support among younger generations. Trying to further pierce this information bubble is thus essential to the war's future and Russian politics for the long term. And that's why it's become a part of the Ukrainian effort happening in some ways that are in the open, in some ways behind the scenes. Reportedly, they've been reaching out on VK to Russian parents to let them know that their son is alive, but that they should, quote, go out and protest, overthrow your government before we bury all in Ukrainian soil, end quote. And in the absence of any Russian government death notifications, a, quote, look for your own, end quote, website was also created to allow parents of Russian soldiers to enter in information and find out if their son has actually been killed in Ukraine. Even its address 
200rf.com is loaded with meaning. It is a reference to Cargo 200, the military term in the old Soviet Union for dead soldiers being flown back home from Afghanistan as the combination of their bodies and coffins had a limit of 200 kilograms. It is a brutal but potent example of both what is to come and how Ukraine wants Russia to know it.